We have uh, conclusive proof. We have inter interviewed an INI investigator who will, who will not uh, come forward and testify that says that, uh, in, in essence, if you were on Freddie's uh, uh, good list, that is, if you were given testimony against the people that he was out to get, that uh, you would be well taken care of and your job would be secure. If, however, you were not on, on, the, on the good list, then pressure would be put on you and uh, you would be run out of the department. We have been fragmented before whenever someone in the legislature or the governor wanted to know businesses' view on something. They went to four or five different people who were business-oriented, but many times they had a different answer. As we mentioned, a logging team is on my, in Montgomery on a regular basis on a full-time basis. 750 to $1 million to elect loop two, the combined pact. Well, let me just read you something. The voting record of that gentleman in, in uh, Jefferson County is 27%. Let me give you another little statistic. Based on voting records, hard work, it's dirty, and it stinks, but it's a very essential part of an occupation that, that we have to have in the state of Alabama. With these people, and the many vocations, not just as garbage men, society, when you're digging down and picking up uh, uh, garbage cans and, that are filled with cat litter and, and uh, everything else, and My supervisor walked up to me and asked myself and other waitress black to go hide. We asked her why. She said, please just go hide now. I will tell you later. I will lose my job. At the time, myself and another black girl went in the bathroom and hid for 30 minutes. When we came out of the bathroom after 30 minutes time, we asked her supervisor why. She said that Jones had a policy that only two black waitresses were supposed to be working at a given time. And that was the practice of Shawnee. She was afraid she would lose her job if she did not do that. Shawnee settled out of court paying Sharon Johnson $20,000 conditioned on her agreement to drop her suit charging discrimination. The restaurant chain also agreed to pay each black waitress in the Montgomery district $2,000 and it agreed to promote blacks to supervisory and management jobs. Shawnee's fired area supervisor Gene Yeager and agreed not to assign him to any supervisory positions in the Montgomery district in the future. Shawnee's national personnel manager declined to provide details about the reason for Yeager's dismissal. He would only say the dismissal was connected to the Johnson lawsuit. Plaintiffs in the Johnson case said Yeager told managers white customers wanted to see a white face when they entered Shawnee's and a white face when they left Shoney's. According to sworn depositions taken during the lawsuit, a loan sharking operation was also being carried out at the Montgomery restaurants. The operation allegedly involved charging kitchen help 20% interest on weekly loans made to them by area supervisor Harvey Hester. Former Shoney's manager Harold Shaw said in his deposition that it was a fairly large scale loan operation. He testified Hester would collect his money on Sunday mornings when the payroll checks came in. Shaw testified further in his deposition that Hester would give him a list of amounts each employee owed in loans for that week. The loan totals would allegedly be taken from the register and paid to Hester. Testimony further indicated that it was up to Shaw to collect the money from employees and return it to Shoney's receipts for the day. Shoney's Incorporated said it could find no evidence of any kind that the company condoned or authorized such loans to employees. 
Further, it stated that the corporation has no control over any employee's private transactions which are not associated with the business of the operation of the restaurants. Shoney's added it has firm policy against the use of its facilities and participation of its employees in any illegal activities. The corporation told WSFA News 12 that corporate profits in the Montgomery area have dropped since Sharon Johnson filed her lawsuit, which contained allegations that black waitresses were ordered to hide in the bathroom because the Montgomery supervisor wanted only two blacks on the floor at any one time. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA News 12. Well, it's a great school. Uh, it's a lot of reasons, but uh, mainly because of uh, the recruiting. They got to me early, and uh, Coach Daniels did a great job of, of recruiting me. Mm -hmm. Well, really, it started out as a lot of fun, but, you know, the last few weeks, everybody seemed to be putting a lot of pressure on me, and so it really got to be really hectic, but I'm just glad it's over with now. Complaints with the redistricting plan come mainly from the city of Auburn. The plan has a district designed to produce at least one black county commissioner, the first ever in Lee County. But a black Auburn councilman yeah, says think he thinks voters there have not had enough input uh, into the redistricting. With, well, I am concerned, you know, how the maps look and, and the representation of Auburn, but my constituents basically have not had that input. The president of the Auburn City Council agrees. Victor Vance says gerrymandering was necessary to give the plan a predominantly black district. Of course, the five districts all intersect in Auburn, uh, thus diluting Auburn's voter input into any commissioner race. The future of the plan now lies in the hands of Lee County's two state representatives and state senator Ted Little. Little says they'll get input from as many people as possible. Then a bill will be drawn up, advertised, and presented to the legislature. It was scheduled by law to conclude by April the 28th. In addition to that, though, the legislature in election year may be desire, desirous of them concluding its session early. That would have a, a bearing on this. However, Senator Little admits that even under the best conditions, getting a redistricting plan for Lee County through the entire process before the June elections will be close. Andrew Findlay, WSFA News 12, Auburn. Knox is charged with eight counts of violating Alabama's income tax laws, including failure to pay his taxes for two years. Defense attorney Bob Morrow. The judge could sentence to less than a year or more than a year, and the appeals courts have said that is unconstitutional. The other ground is one of the statutes is so vague, if you read it, you don't know what conduct's being regulated. And another ground is that, one of the st that when you read the heading on the statute, and read the body, you think you're reading two different things. And the Constitution requires that the heading tell you what's in the statute. State revenue officials say the law is constitutional and should be allowed to stand. Both sides get a chance to make their points in court beginning February 28th. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA News 12.
information is still coming in on that. Right so they now, proceed we we to tell her to go to the bank, draw X amount of money. Um, one of the bank examiners will come to your home, get this money, go deposit it in the bank, and once she make an attempt to steal the money, then we will catch her. We'll return your money to you along with a sizable reward. These two individuals return to Montgomery sometime around. Home warrants from the other city? Yes. Okay. So it could be several months or even a year before you get your hands on it. Yes, it will be a while before we. One big one and something happens to it, of course, you know what happens. So we do it also who, uh, I believe Ralph Graham here too, your division. Fertilizer to the local uh, farmers as well as to other fertilizer companies. You've been my friend and coordinator down there a lot. Working with Florida Favorite Fertilizer and have mm -hmm. looked forward to working with Florida Favorite in any capacity that we can to make them feel at home. I think you people like to make a statement uh, with the public say much about Thank Henry. Thank you very much. But Henry Stegall was also. The nation, this nation, the world, had a recent tragedy. assisting them with water. That's about all we can do. Empathy that people have towards politics. You shake ten hands and change this future, grocery store and bought your dog food. And until we get serious about running state government to the degree that we expect some professionalism, we're going to continue to be an island to ourselves. And there are some people that say, I like being an island. Maybe so, but I'll tell you right now, the bottom line is, where is this state going to be in the future? And if you had $10,000 to invest in Carbon Hill, Alabama, or you had $10,000 to invest in Spring Hill, Tennessee, for the Saturn plant. Years from now. Rules Committee That's Chairman Charles me. Bishop was intent as I he spoke to the Senate. To he was I reacting to published reports critical of his Rules Committee meetings, which were often hard to find and rarely publicized in advance. Bishop says the criticism is shedding bad publicity on Lieutenant Governor Bill Baxley, a gubernatorial candidate who, as Attorney General nearly a decade ago, ruled that those committee meetings should be open to the public. We haven't done anything in the Rules Committee. It hasn't been going on for 25 years, anything different. You know that, each of you. Now, we're going to have our Rules Committee public, just exactly like the press wants them to be. Meanwhile, the legislature is being pressured by the Wallace administration to get to work on the so-called tort reform bills. Those would help limit the malpractice lawsuits and liability lawsuits. Currently, the bills are locked up in committee and are expected to generate some heated debate when they surface. 
Meanwhile, many lawmakers are upset with Governor Wallace for freezing more than $14 million in education funds. Those lawmakers say the money was part of local projects promised by the governor. The administration says until there's a clearer picture of overall money shortages, everything will be held unless absolutely necessary. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA News 12 at the Alabama State House. The news, they said the space shuttle blew it up and it got caught from the fire and the gasoline come out of it. I, I think they should not give the space shuttle first thing. Would you like to be an astronaut someday? No. Why not? Because it explodes. I think, um... It was not fair for them to die and for us. Because um, I think they should stay alive more better than they did when they died. What do you think of the balloon release today? I think, I think, I, I think if we let them go, we'll say bye bye to them. All right. All right. In federal court in Opelika, a woman is suing Macon County Sheriff Lucius Amers and a list of county officials. Lolita Parker claims the defendants in the case were negligent in hiring one of its former jailers, who was later convicted of raping the woman. Andrew Findlay of our staff has been in Opelika today, He's standing by in Auburn now for this live report on the $7.5 million lawsuit. Andy? Bob, Lolita Parker is alleging that Macon County and Sheriff Amerson were negligent in hiring Mike Williams as the chief jailer. Ms. Parker's attorneys are saying that Amerson knew Williams had a record of mental problems, and they're saying that the sheriff knew that Williams had had a prior conviction of indecent exposure in Opelika. However, Williams has been a fugitive since last August, after he was convicted of raping the plaintiff. Williams is a defendant, as well as the sheriff and Macon County, but neither Williams nor Amerson have been at this trial so far. Federal Judge Truman Hobbs told the jury this morning, uh, rather this afternoon, that uh, Amerson was not subpoenaed to appear at the trial, but he was supposed to be there in a sort of gentleman's agreement. However, Hobbs granted the plaintiffs a request to read from a uh, September 1985 deposition. And uh, where is Amerson right now? Well, his attorneys say he is en route back to Macon County but they will not admit from where. However, attorneys for the plaintiffs say that the sheriff is supposed to be back from a trip to Mississippi. Andrew, one of the things that, uh, one of the questions that comes to mind now is uh, in the deposition that was read today from uh, Sheriff Amerson, did he disclaim any of the accounts of uh, uh, knowledge of, of Williams hiring? Yes, he did, Bob. He was asked uh, in that September uh, deposition whether or not he had checked any of Williams' references. In the deposition, which was read by another of the plaintiff's attorneys, uh, the sheriff said that he called three of uh, Williams' uh, references and that he ran an NCIC check through the National uh, Crime Information Center, and that proved out to be nil, that there was no information that Williams had a prior conviction. However, when he was asked point blank if, he, if anyone whether responsible or irresponsible, had told the sheriff if he knew of any trouble that Williams might have been in, the sheriff said no. Thanks a lot. Andrew Finley live in Auburn tonight. We'll have more on that. Hi, he's been kind enough to uh, join us uh, tonight on this report, and we appreciate you doing that, Bobby. We want to just get the words from you. What is your situation, and have you made up your mind what you're going to do? Uh, I haven't made up my mind yet. Uh, I'm still in question. Uh, I have a lot of things to think about, and it's sort of uh, like a leave of absence, I think. Did, is the problem with the knee, Bobby, is it, uh, is, is it that you're afraid you might do permanent damage to that right knee? Yes, all the cartilage and everything is all right in my knee uh, as far as that goes, but uh, I have severe bone damage inside now, and uh, that's unrepairable, and uh, we'll just have to go from there. I see. How do your folks feel about the situation? They're real upset. They, they're upset for me because it's a game that I love, and uh, 
I'd like to play here at Auburn, and if I still can, I will. But uh, I also have to look out for my own future. Well, I know you'll make the right decision. By the way, how's the guitar picking coming along? It's doing good, doing good. Maybe, Keeping up with it. Okay. Maybe you could be the next Chet Atkins. Thank you, Bobby, for so. being with us. All right. Wimp Sanderson's Alabama basketball. LSU brings its much-traveled band of Tigers to meet a Tiger of another stripe tonight at Auburn. It's a makeup game because of the LSU chicken pox episode 10 days ago. Jim Jackson is at the Auburn Coliseum with an update of tonight's game. Jim, uh, how about it? Are they going to show this time? Yeah, they are expected to be here. We spoke with Coach Dale Brown of LSU earlier this afternoon, the team staying this afternoon in Columbus, Georgia. We posed the coach two questions. First, about his team's stamina. They have been on the road. They have lost... Uh, Five, or they've, uh, this will be their fifth game tonight in 14 days. Uh, LSU comes into town tonight with a loss Saturday to Georgia, a loss Sunday to Georgetown, and they're in Auburn tonight for the makeup game. They'll also be in Starkville, Mississippi tomorrow night. So LSU has been on the road, and they are winless in the SEC since the uh, first of the year. About the team's stamina, Coach Brown told us, and we quote, that uh, they don't like to make any excuses. These are the cars that he has been dealt. And these are the ones that he will play with. The second question was a statement that was reported Sunday night by the Associated Press concerning Coach Brown and his possible retirement at the end of the season. He did not elaborate on that statement Sunday in Landover, Maryland with the Georgetown game. His response to us today was that he has given thought to leaving the game of college basketball. We asked him when that might be. He said it could be two or it could be 20 years, but that he has given thought about leaving the game of college basketball. And two other points we want to make out tonight. John Williams, the LSU star who was affected by the chicken pox, this will be his third game tonight back since that deal with the chicken pox. He uh, appears to be back. He scored 27 points Sunday in the loss to Georgetown. And as far as Auburn, they will have to do better on the boards. The rebounding has not been the best of late. Four times this year, Auburn has been beaten by teams that out-rebounded them. We'll have highlights and interviews tonight at 10 to join us then. It's Jim Jackson reporting live for Auburn. WSFA 12 Sports. Thank you, Jim Jackson. We will have a report for you. Is the problem with the knee, Bobby, is it, uh, is, is it that you're afraid you might do permanent damage to that right knee? Yes, all the cartilage and everything is all right in my knee uh, as far as that goes, but uh, I have severe bone damage inside now, and uh, that's unrepairable, and uh, we'll just have to go from there. I see. How do your folks feel about it? The situation they're real upset they, they're upset for me because this is a game that I love and uh, I'd like to play here at Auburn and if I still can I will but uh, I also have to look out for my own future who's gonna have the ultimate decision will it be Bobby I think Bobby will make a decision I you know I don't think that uh, uh, I certainly can't make a decision like that for him uh, I think his mother and father uh, would go along with what he wanted to do uh, and uh, they certainly not pushing him to play but at the same time, they realize what football meant to him, and, uh, you know, they're not sure that he's ready to give it up. We just couldn't stop John Williams. We tried to, uh, we tried to buy some time with a zone and, and take him out of the game a little bit with zone in the first half. And in the second half, it, uh, I think he gets 12 of their 27 buckets. Yeah. Well, he's a very physical player. Um, he came back from a layoff, and he came back ready to play. 
And I think he was more hungry than he was, and then they got the win. Well, I've been really pleased with them all week. You know, we've lost two heartbreakers by two points to Georgetown and Kentucky and could have won them. And considering all the hardship that we've had, I'm, I'm really proud of them. And I'm not any more proud tonight than I was at Georgetown or Kentucky. Second half of the game, Jeff Lebo, another miss. Rebound is grabbed by Sally to Bruce Dalrymple. He'll go all the way. Tech would lead by 10 with only 10 minutes to go. But then late in the game, Georgia Tech's lead is down to 70 to 68. North Carolina's Brad Darty hits a turnaround jump shot. It was 70 all. This game would go into overtime. Georgia Tech coach Bobby Kremens directing the attack. Georgia Tech will make a costly turnover. Mark Price with the ball, trying to go inside. Stolen by Steve Hale. Hale ahead to Kenny Smith, North Carolina over Georgia Tech, 78-77. I'm George Michael for NBC News. Well, I thought it was... Um very appropriate to this year, this time in the state of our union. I think he addressed uh, the challenges that we face today, and he addressed them more bipartisanly and less confrontationally, uh, less politically, I believe, than in the past. And um, I think that the response he elicits will be quite positive, both in the Senate, the House, and from both parties. Uh, it was a good speech. and. Sort of gave an agenda for his next three years, didn't give us a lot of details, but uh, we'll look forward to other messages from him relative to his programs. He mentioned the balance of budget amendment as an afterthought to Graham Rudman. How did you feel about that? Well, I was disappointed in the way he said that because I'm a strong believer in a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. He almost sounded as if we won't pass a a constitutional amendment to balance the budget until after Graham Rudman, which is five years from now. I just don't think we ought to do it. He says that after we make these hard choices, go through Graham Rudman, we will then lock in a balanced budget with a constitutional amendment. Well, I don't even wait until then. Ms. Parker's lawyers claim she suffered severe emotional and psychological damage since she was raped in 1984 by former Macon County Chief Jailer Mike Williams, and her lawyers are trying to prove the county and Sheriff Lucius Amerson are responsible for Ms. Parker's stress, since the lawyers say the county and Amerson hired Williams. According to a deposition read during the trial, Amerson claims he did not know Williams had a conviction for indecent exposure. However, Barney Harding with the Peace Officer Standards and Training Department testified that he told the sheriff that Williams had a conviction on his record. Amerson was called upon to testify, but was not at the proceedings. Presiding Judge Truman Hobbs explained to the seven-member jury that the sheriff was not subpoenaed to appear. Then the judge allowed Amerson's deposition to be entered. Andrew Findlay, WSFA News 12, Opelika. dead in the House Ways and Means Committee, you know, <laughs> means that we are going to have to take up the slack. And Brother Potts and, and Brother Nail and others, we're going to be calling on you more and very much. I should like to Ms. Harper Shannon, who is the wife of Dr. Harper Shannon. Elected officials at today's prayer luncheon were quick to point out legislative matters these Baptists wanted to hear. And I give one example of that is the Lottery Act, which is now pending, but I think dead in the House Ways and Means Committee. You know. Campaigning politicians dotted the audience, including candidates vying for Lieutenant Governor Bill Baxley's current job and perhaps his future one. But Baxley bestowed compliments on all. Even the ones that I've run against. 
are people that when it boils down to it are honorable, decent, God-fearing people. Governor Wallace didn't talk campaign politics. Instead, he talked about the effects of the Graham-Rudman Act. It means that we are going to have to take up the slack. And Brother Potts and, and Brother Nail and others, we're going to be calling on you more and more. And the next governor of Alabama be calling you more and more. Next governor? What does that mean? No, that, 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 that has no uh, implications whatsoever of any sort. And the game of cat and mouse continues. This is Lisa Walsh, WSFA News 12. But most people need to be on an activity program to eat sounder, wiser, more regular, uh, to think about uh, healthy things like wearing seat belts, uh, to think about themselves as positive, active people, and to not worry so much about things that they have little control or influence over. This latest complaint comes in the form of a letter from the State Employees Association signed by one of the association's field representatives, Barry Mask. Mask claims the transfer of DPS employees to supervisory jobs out in the counties won't save the department any money, and more significantly, won't help meet the needs of clients who depend on services provided by the department. Because we're reassigning people who cannot really help them. We need to increase we need more workers, not just uh, transferred workers. Mask believes the reorganization came without adequate study by DPS Commissioner Gwendolyn Williams. She says that isn't so. Ms. Williams says she spent at least two months studying the situation before making the moves, but one employee affected by the move talked with us, saying it's not a matter of questioning Ms. Williams' authority to make changes, but rather an objection to employees being transferred as punishment. Ms. Williams denies that charge. She says the transfers meet personnel board guidelines, were made only after requests for help from county offices, and says employees who were transferred will have first shot at state DPS job openings. Mask has sent a letter to Governor Wallace asking him to stop, quote, these ill-advised personnel moves. Mask says the persons who will ultimately pay the price for these moves will be the very young, the elderly, the poor, and the handicapped who depend on pensions and security for help. Andrew Findlay, WSFA News 12. What is it that Huey Long used to say that, that is not? But at the same time, we go out of our way to encourage. You take a county like Coosa, which I also represent. Of the oil fund money. It's uh, in this area. I think we've got to come to a time in the state of Alabama when we give all public employees uh, the same benefits and the same cost of living raises. They all work for us. They all work for the taxpayers of the state. And certainly we should treat uh, both groups just alike. Write us a letter and tell us what you think. You're not politically active like you are. One other thing. We do not appeal. Surprised, shocked, disappointed, and tragic reaction from plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, I am sure this is going to create an atmosphere where uh, the black plaintiffs in some other cases, like the desegregation case, are not going to be interested in settling with anybody on any terms from this point forward. But educators are pleased with the ruling. Now they may get a chance to defend the controversial teacher certification program in court. I want to commend the judge for uh, uh, taking a second look at his order. 
and feeling that ever he thinks he may have made a mistake. He I'm not for weakening the matter of certificates for teachers to teach in Alabama. Attorney General Charles Granick called the decision a victory for public education in Alabama. Granick, who vowed to fight the lawsuit, said the issue should be aired in court and not negotiated in a clandestine meeting in Birmingham. Those board members knew what they were doing in Birmingham in that hotel room, and they were there voluntarily. We didn't herd them into that hotel room. Now it's back to square one, at least for now. No more consent decrees, a delay in attorney's fees, and a freeze on experts to devise a new test. Even though Judge Thompson says he still feels board members had legally authorized the settlement with the plaintiffs, he felt the case will have broad impact on the public, and he said he's reluctant to base a decision merely on oral testimony. Now, the court awaits the decision from the plaintiffs whether to appeal the ruling or go to trial. An alternative, plaintiffs' attorneys say they were prepared to exercise early on if the settlement had not been reached in Birmingham. A decision is expected early next week. This is Kim Davis, WSFA News 12 at the Federal Courthouse. One of the highest risk patients emergency room doctors face are indigent mothers. The women rarely have had any prenatal care and any of their medical complications come as a surprise to the doctor. It has led to complicated deliveries and doctors being sued. I am trying to put a band-aid on this situation. That Today, Senator Larry Dixon met opposition from the Senate Judiciary Committee as he tried to convince it that those doctors need immunity from lawsuits when dealing with indigent pregnant women. Poor people are entitled to just as good standard of care as, as people that can afford it, and this is a direct effort to circumvent that. Decatur Senator and attorney Gary Aldridge says Dixon's bill is filled with legal problems. As I see it, it will probably lower the standard of care. It does not address the care that will be given to these people. Montgomery Senator and Attorney Charles Langford says the overall approach is wrong. Birmingham Senator and Attorney Earl Hilliard, chairman of the committee, called the meeting to an end before a vote was taken. The source of the opposition is primarily a concern with suing uh, for, you know, suing physicians and, and when a bad, bad baby is delivered. That's primarily it. It's, it's, coming, it's coming primarily for, from the trial lawyers that, are, that, that make their living this way and they don't want the system to be disrupted. Dixon uh, says he'll try again next week. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA News 12 at the Alabama State House. But uh, I felt like uh, watching the lieutenant governor get cut apart. Uh, over, over the answer the system has been sold to the public. If we're going to use it, we had to have an agenda to start to work on Priority, that's the whole purpose for the Rules Committee. It's not to set priority. Well, well when? Set them on the calendar. When? T tomorrow. All of these are going to be on the All calendar. All these are going to be on the calendar tomorrow. Fine, that's what. in Montgomery and many of the rest of you here are glad. And what the private sector can do, having concluded a fantastically, he remembers the people that sent him there and he remembers the interests of the people that sent him up there. He is for Alabama and from Alabama and he's a great United States Senator and you've got to re-elect him next fall. <laughs> like us and I think there's something good about that for the country. Between night and day, the Senate works with the president. And we want More than 1,000 people who paid up to $500 a plate crowded into Mobile's Expo Hall to hear Vice President Bush commend and applaud Alabama Senator Jeremiah Denton. A close friend of Denton's, Bush has often appeared with the Senate freshman, and today's visit was aimed at raising money for Denton's campaign war chest. And there isn't any senator who is a stronger more courageous defender of conservative principles than Jerry Denton. And so again, I appeal to you, send him back to Washington. America needs him there. Bush called Denton one of the Senate's most courageous and principled voices. He likened Denton to President Reagan by saying both Republicans are fighting for a stronger America, a balanced budget, and ending illegal drug traffic. We have got to have the tools to keep the peace, to stop the drug smugglers, and to stop terrorists, and to stop madmen like Gaddafi. We must not return to the days of American weakness. If we are to keep America growing, 
and at peace. The federal budget must not put Amtrak above a strong defense and paying off some special interest lobby above keeping taxes down. Benton's campaign organizers say his close ties to the president and vice president have greatly improved his political image, and today's visit won't hurt him at the ballot box. It translates to everyone who's ever admired Ronald Reagan is now translated into admiring uh, uh, Jeremiah Denton, and of course that, that, that adds up at the ballot box. It'll be a phenomenal impact. The vice president came to Mobile today to help Senator Denton, to help him raise money in his campaign and maybe down the line so Senator Denton will help the Vice President in his future political plans. Dean Argo, WSFA News 12, Mobile. I suppose it's possible, but uh, like I said earlier, I put myself on the line every time I went out there. I'm fighting for what I believe in. Money's not an issue when I go out, walk on the court. Uh, what I go out there for is to be the best I can possibly be, and I expect that of everyone else that walks on the court to be a part of my match. And uh, the problem is, is that the level of officiating is so far below that of other sports that. Uh, what I've done with I think will help in the future. It's just that uh, sometimes when you're the first guy to really put yourself out there, uh, people look at it like you're a spoiled, uh, spoiled brat. Or those aren't the reasons I'm really doing it at all. I'm doing that purely aesthetically because uh, I want to be the best I can possibly be in tennis to be seen in the best possible light. He's got a lot of potential. He won the French a couple of years. Any athlete's number one fear, I think, is the in fear of injury. And I've had some problems in the last year that uh, didn't have an 84, which is my best year as professional. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, I feel good every time I walk on the court, physically, but also mentally. And I think a lot of the things that have been going on with me the past couple years have kind of worn, worn on me. And I don't feel as, as fresh as I felt, say, in the past. And uh, that's why I want to take a step back, to appreciate what I have, to realize how lucky I really am. And therefore, I can look at it from a different perspective, because I think I've just gotten caught up in my own little world. And uh, I need sometimes to come to cities like this or to go to do some charity things or not to play for a while in order to appreciate really what I have. If I serve well and come to the net, that's the way I usually beat the guys I'm playing. If I have to adjust to his game, then uh, I have to return serves, I have to hit good passing shots. But uh, first I'm going to try to concentrate on my own plan and my own style, which is serve hard and come into the net. It was obvious by the way they played defense, LSU was angered by what they perceived an injustice done them by Auburn, requiring them to play the makeup game last night after two road games in three days. It came down to the wire, with Michael Jones hitting to give Auburn a two-point lead under two minutes to go. Then, with Derek Taylor popping from the outside to tie it with a minute to play. Taylor then deflected a person pass, and the Bengals had their chance to win. They made the most of it. Inside to John Williams, the crucial basket for the star of the game who scored 28 points and showed absolutely no signs of the chicken pucks. Michael Jones shot to tie, bounced off the rim as the game ended. LSU had won 63-61. The postponement obviously worked in LSU's favor, and the perceived mistreatment in rescheduling didn't hurt either. I think, I think the team felt that we were mistreated because um, we could have played them like Coach say, another week, um, I think it was a Monday, 
on a weekend that they could have played Alabama the, that weekend, like Saturday or Sunday. So they had a whole weekend. They couldn't fit us into their schedule. So um, I feel like we really owed them something. So um, we just went out and played hard. I mean, we wanted to dig down deep inside and pull out a win. We played very good defenses. We changed up defenses constantly, and I thought that was important. And I, uh, I thought the job done on Chuck Person, Chuck Person is one of the greatest players in America. And the job that Oliver Brown and the team did on Chuck the first half going three for nine gave us hope. That, gave us, that kept us in the game. General Westmoreland says there's a different attitude on college campuses these days, different from the times right after the Vietnam War when he would answer students' questions. I mean, they, they want to know what the facts are, and I have the facts. I, and they're, they're polite, and uh, they're interested, and uh, they want to know. He says the upbeat national mood has a lot to do with it, and the fact that he thinks television has come of age. After all, this is the man who filed and then dropped a suit against CBS for a 60 Minutes report that said he misrepresented troop strength while in command of U.S. forces in Vietnam. But have the media changed as well? What is, what is your network? NBC. Oh. <laughs> yes. The general recalled the times during World War II in Korea when the media kept some military things quiet in the interests of national security and of keeping morale up at home. Westmoreland says he sympathizes with the media in its role in covering military actions. However, when asked whether he thought the U.S. military would ever get the support it got from the media in World War II, he said he didn't know. Andrew Findlay, WSFA News 12, Auburn University. Mark Thornhill is standing by at Garrett Coliseum where the exhibition will be held tonight. Mark, fill us in on what's going to happen out there tonight. Well, I don't know if you can see behind me or not. They're getting ready to go. Some of the uh, junior tennis players are here. They're warming up. They, they will be taking part in a future stars match, which gets underway at 7 o'clock tonight. Also, of course, the feature match, as you mentioned, between John McEnroe and Yannick Noah. That gets underway at 8.35 tonight. Three local players will be teaming up with uh, McEnroe and Noah in the celebrity doubles match. That gets underway at 11.05 tonight. A couple of pre-match notes, first of all an interesting court if you can uh, pan down we'll take a look at it it's a court made of uh it's like a carpet in fact they rolled it in they roll it out it's uh, an interesting uh, material it's made of vinyl supported by fiberglass with foam on the bottom so it's a slower court than uh, most outdoor courts slower than asphalt or concrete it's comparable to clay they tell us another uh, note garrett coliseum seats about 8800 people and uh, we talked to uh, coliseum officials they say they're expecting a crowd 
of about 5,000 tonight, so it should be a good crowd. Of course, most of the eyes in that crowd will be focused on John McEnroe, but what about his opponent, Yannick Noah? Well, we spoke with Noah earlier today. We asked him what he thought it would take to beat McEnroe. Serve well and come to the net. That's the way I usually beat the guys I'm playing. If I have to adjust to his game, then uh, I have to return serves, I have to hit good passing shots. But uh, first I'm going to try to concentrate on my own plan and my own style, which is serve hard and come into the net. Okay, Phil, we have suddenly gone dark here, as you see, but uh, we're still here getting ready for a big tennis match tonight. One quick question. What do you think about McEnroe? You spent a little time with him. Yeah, we were talking coming back. He's, he's just a bundle of energy, as we were talking about. He just couldn't sit still almost during the interview, but it's kind of a controlled kind of an energy. I like it. I'm, I'll go against you. I think I'd vote for him for governor of New York. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, history dictates that SEC basketball... There is no simple, single, one-time evaluation that can make that big a decision. It must be done over a period of time. The measurement of prediction of who's going to be a good teacher is complicated, requires the judgment of many people over a period of time, and the entire teacher education enterprise from the beginning of the time they hit college to the time they get out, plus test, is probably the best way to go about it. To build in the legislature every year to eliminate Still beaming over Judge Myron Thompson's sudden about face to scrap lowered standards for teacher testing in Alabama, Attorney General Charles Graddock wants the public to know just who passed the December competency exam. The results will show two things, who passed the test using the lowered requirements and who passed the original Alabama certification exam. Results from AUM show a near-perfect passage rate under court-ordered standards. I think the public has an absolute right to know how many people took that test. Graddock also wants the legislature to mandate use of the national teacher examination in Alabama, a test upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. There's been talk in the past about using the NTE. It certainly is a real possibility. That's obviously a decision that will be made either by the legislature or the State Board of Education, but certainly at this point there would be no legal barrier to using it. But educators are still studying the judge's order and their options in the case. They're not sure of the future of the students who took the December exam and what to do about the March test date. One option is to rescore the December test using criteria from the initial exam to confirm Graddock's suspicion that, as he put it, the adjusted scores will reflect the impact of lowered standards on the overall quality of teachers entering the classroom. Kim Davis, WSFA News 12, at the Attorney General's office. Ruby Thornton, Mrs. Bowie's sister-in-law who lives next door, says her dog started barking wildly about 11.30 last night, and then less than an hour later, the police arrived. When police units arrived here, they discovered the body of three small juveniles. Um, all three juveniles uh, suffered from uh, knife wounds to their upper uh, body area. Uh, they were pronounced dead on the scene by the paramedics. Mr. Bowie was also uh, located here in the room with the uh, kids. Uh, he also suffered uh, knife wounds to his neck. Bowie was taken to Jackson Hospital where he was treated, released, and charged with murdering his seven-year-old daughter and eight- and four-year-old sons. He's being held in Montgomery County Jail without bond. Mrs. Bowie's sister-in-law says the couple have been married for 10 years and that last night wasn't the first time police had been to the house. This is Lisa Walsh, WSFA News 12. Police found 8-year-old Ty Knox, 7-year-old Julie, and 4-year-old Nicole in their parents' bed with their throats slashed. Lieutenant Larry Armstead says their father, Kwong Bowie, lay on the bedroom floor, still alive, and suffering from apparently self-inflicted neck wounds. Bowie was treated and released from Jackson Hospital and is now in Montgomery County Jail, held without bond. Although Lieutenant Armstead will not speculate on the motive for the killings, he says Bowie's wife, Jeannie, called police headquarters at midnight fearing for the lives of her children. Considering the circumstance, mother's holding up uh, okay. Of course, she's uh, 
uh, real bad off emotionally. You know, we uh, going to get back with her, with her at a later date and speak with her further about it. But right now, we have not been able to get very much out of it. Relatives say Mrs. Bowie left her husband of 10 years two days ago, but had called home to check on the children. And then she called last night? Yeah. And want to know why the baby crying, because Nicole was crying. And she he just said, bye, honey, on the telephone. I guess that was the time we done it. Mrs. Bowie's brother, who lives in the same house but wasn't home last night, says Bowie is a hardworking carpenter who keeps to himself. Well, later don't pay as a... Uh, I get about seven days that north. It's real heavy. That's something I can't understand either. Neighbors say four other relatives were inside the house at the time of the stabbings, but neighbors say no one appears to have heard anything except the dogs barking. This is Lisa Walsh, WSFA News 12. I feel very good. Uh, it, it just demonstrates that the, the jury was able to perceive what was going on, and it's a vindication for the system. Uh, there was a wrong uh, inflicted upon Lolita Parker. Uh, the jury here heard all the evidence, uh, paid attention to it, which is, which is what we all want, and discussed it and came back uh, and, and made the right decision, of course, as we feel, but more so than that, it really does, again, vindicate the system, no matter where this would have happened. Since last week, the House has been dragging its feet on the seatbelt bill, but the sponsor, Mike Box, always felt he had the votes to get it passed, so it caught him completely off guard when the House voted 46 to 45 against his bill. After I looked at the record of the votes, it, it surprised me, because there were, a few, there were a few people that I think either got confused or changed their mind and didn't tell me. The idea to force people to buckle up is primarily motivated by a threat from the federal government to require airbags in all cars if states don't mandate seatbelt use. But that threat from the federal government is also the source of the opposition. They tell me, my constituency, you and we are all the time criticizing the federal government about infringing upon our personal rights, and now you here at this state level, you are doing the same thing. There's always a chance the measure could be revived next week in the House, and there's always another version over in the Senate. But today's vote is a devastating turn of events for proponents of the bill. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA News 12, at the Alabama State House. Nobody ever said life at the top was easy. Tennis superstar John McEnroe is certainly finding that out. 
For a while, he totally dominated men's professional tennis. Recently, however, his game has fallen on some hard times. Following a string of upset losses, Mack has decided to take a vacation from the game. The consistency hasn't been as good as I liked. I'd go out there and play a great match, and then the next time I didn't feel like I'd be quite the same. I felt like when I was going out there that I really wasn't uh, what people expect of me every time I go out there. And I don't want to go out there for myself or for the spectators that pay to see you when I don't feel like I'm 100% and giving 100%. Of course, there's speculation that Mac's personal life away from the court might have had some bearing in his decision. He's engaged to marry actress Tatum O'Neill soon. The two are expecting their first child next month. I haven't set a date to get married, but uh, I'm looking forward to that as well as looking forward to having a baby. It's the most exciting time, exciting thing in my life right now. One prospect that isn't so exciting to McEnroe is that perhaps at the age of 27, He's beginning to give way to father time. Maybe uh, in two years' time, I might have lost a half a step, but I'll have to look to pick that up in some other form. But that's not something that's a, a pleasant thought. You try to uh, try to look at more positive things. So for now, career in limbo. John McEnroe is looking to do just that. Mark Thornhill, WSFA TV Sports.